Hi, I'm Mike Haddock and today I'm at the Coral Castle in Homestead, Florida. Now I did a video on this before, but I'm doing a video on carving stones with ancient technology, part two. And when I first came here, they're saying this guy knew levitation, he knew how to build the pyramids, he knew how to quarry stone that nobody knew how to do, and he did everything at night because he didn't want anybody to see him do it. What happened was years later they found the film of him actually doing it, which refuted everything everybody else was saying. So what I want to do in this video is expose the kind of things that I see that everybody's telling you that they can't do, that we could do. So here we go. Now anybody who went to the Coral Castle, this is the guy who built it. He was only 90 pounds from Latvia. And he was moving stones that were 30 tons. And everybody's telling you, oh, he had help from the aliens. It was uh, levitation. He knew the secrets of the pyramids. He did it at night. And then they found a film of he actually doing it. He used to rent the place out for parties. And he wanted everybody to see what he was doing. But they made all this stuff up telling you all this nonsense that wasn't true. So my whole thing on this video is I'm going to repute all the stuff that these people are telling you. Now any of you who know me and watched all my videos know that I've been a stonemason all my life. I was born in the early 50s. I used to go to the quarries with my dad when they were still carving stones and, and pulling them out of the quarries and working with them. I used to move houses and heavy objects and stone. And I worked with a lot of carvers and uh, a lot of restoration projects. So this is my whole thing my whole life. Now, a lot of people write me in and say, you can't do this, you can't do that, and you can't do the other thing. Well, today I'm going to be what you call a bedroom archaeologist. I'm someone who goes to a spare bedroom. Here's the bed. And I'm going to tell you all this stuff. And I'm going to let it up to you to decide whether it's common sense or it ain't. The first thing we're going to look at is can we move big heavy objects and stones? So let's look first at the Thunderstone, which is the world largest stone moved by man. It's in St. Petersburg, Russia, and they did it in 1768, and it weighs 1,500 tons while they were doing it. It took them nine months to move it over land and then by barge, and it took 400 men, and they moved it five miles. Now the obelisk in Rome. The Roman Caesars actually took some of the obelisks from Egypt and they put it on a barge, 300 oarsmen, rowed it across the Mediterranean and re-erected it in Rome. And then years later, they did the same thing. And that was the drawing over that. So it's not a big deal moving 370 tons like everybody thinks it is. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about ancient cranes. The Romans had a lot of cranes, and the Egyptians had cranes, and the people to build the cathedral had cranes. I did this little thing in Israel. It's called the Stonemason's Commentary. Here's a couple things that I wanted you to see when you go to these archaeological sites and they have a display. This is how they put the stone inside of a wheel, and they move it around that way to make it easier to move. And the other little part of the exhibit as you can see right here is a wooden crane how they would pick those stones up in ancient times there's a lot of pictures of ancient cranes this is one from they were doing the Colosseum this is one from the cathedrals they had a big wheel they turn it that's one of the waterways so you can look all over the internet and find things about ancient cranes I have a video out, it's called Derricks and Cranes, and I was at the main granite museum. The only difference between what they used in the ancients and how they used these cranes is that these were made out of steel, but the ancients were made out of wood, but they worked exactly the same way. So if you go to this channel, this guy moves a 20 ton block all by himself, a concrete block. He was in a construction business and they would use different techniques to move blocks. And he shows you to how to do it just like an obelisk. Now there's a lot of stuff all over the internet showing you how to move a lot of different things a lot of different ways. All you got to do is just kind of keep searching for it. Throughout my other pyramid videos, I show different ways that you would actually move the big stones and they had elephants and they had oxen 
And I live near Amish country. And here's a video called Amish Shed Move, where the guys actually picked a 20-ton barn up and moved it all by hand. So moving is not as big a deal as everybody thinks. You just got to have the right amount of people. Well, so far, I've been a pretty good bedroom archaeologist. I didn't get my hands dirty. I just point at things and tell you stuff. But I have to do this anyway. When I was a kid, we were lifting up a house to move it. They were putting a highway in. And we ran out of jacks. And the old timers were there, and they tooted the building out, and they had the jacks on her, but they were short a couple. And I said to the guy, what are we going to do, go buy more jacks? He goes, no, you use wedges. One guy get on one side and hammer, and the other guy get on the other side and hammer, and up it would go. Now let's look at this picture with the wedges in. You see the wedge here and the wedge here. It's holding up this old shed. One guy hits on this side, one guy hits on that side. You see, the old timers knew how to do all this stuff. The young people don't know how to do it. That's why they make up all these crazy things. Now let's look at Corian. So if you don't know anything about limestone quarrying, I would go to this site first. Limestone cutting the old way demonstrated by the Bush vision. Now this is what they used to do, and they were doing this up into the 90s. All you got to do is use regular saws, because I told you limestone's like butter, and cut it out. It was the old school way of doing it, yet they make a big mystery out of quarrying. Now let's go to the Pyramid of Khafre. When I was in Egypt, this is the actual quarry that they were mining rock out of. Now they're all telling you, oh, you can't fit a, a human hair between the stones they used on the pyramid. It's all nonsense. They filled it with junk. They quarried it just like any other thing. Let's see what my brother says. My brother actually owns a stone yard and he's in quarries all the time. So this is still the bedrock in the corner of Cafe, the Pyramid of Cafe. And you could see they went all the way up till they ran out and then they started filling in with other stone, smaller pieces. So you see this, I'm in the quarry. You could see where they quarried all the stones out of here. And this was for the interior of the pyramid. Now on the facade, they used a different type of stone that went up. They put that on first and then they filled in the back with junk and then they just kept going. Now since we're this far, let's do a little myth. The pyramids are so precise, you can't even fit a human hair between them. And the same thing with Mono Picchu, I hear the same thing. That is total nonsense. First of all, if you go in the pyramids, you're going to see where they're all on the side were mortared. Why did they do that? If you ever go into the bent pyramid, you're going to see bats and spiders and bugs and all that other stuff. They didn't want that inside the pyramid. In Florida, we have uh, ants that are so small you can barely see them. You think they're not going to be crawling all through the pyramids? That's why they seal them up tight with mortar. So don't let anybody believe that. Let's just look at a couple of examples. So it looks like a lot of the bigger stones are on the bottom, and as they went up, the stones got smaller. Yes, they did. You know, maybe half the size. Half the size, and smaller and smaller. So that's the way it was. The big stones went on the bottom, smaller stones went on top, and they built the outside first and they filled the center with junk or what we call riprap in the masonry business. It's the way they've been building for years and years and years. So don't let them tell you you can't put a human hair between them. It's ridiculous. Now I have a whole series out called Rock Facing and Shaping Stones and I do some examples of quarrying. And all you have to do is shim it away and then you could take it into another position at another job and replace them the same way that's why they got them so tight and then just face them. Now if you ever went to Mono Picchu like I've been, uh, it's a nice impressive site, but it's not as big a deal as you think it is. And the stones are tight, but they're not super tight. And if you look around and you walk around Mono Picchu, you can see the quarry type of stones they used. And they're all ready before they quarry them in position that they want them. So all they do is wedge them away from each other and then replace them where they want the wall to go. That's how they get them so tight. Now, if you ever went to Sacha Yuman, you're going to look at it, and it's impressive from the beginning. Yeah, they moved some big stones, and they did get them pretty tight, but you could put a lot of human hairs between them. You could throw a cat between some of the holes. But here's what they don't show you. They don't show you what's around back, where they didn't finish it, and how it was just roughly put in. Anything that works, fit the stone, get it over with. They make all these documentaries, but they show you the front, but they never show you the back. 
Now we're going to a sandstone quarry in my area, and I've worked out of this quarry for years, and I worked in it actually uh, rock facing the stones. I'll do a little example of that, but here's what I want you to see. As you go to the top of the quarry, the stones are real thin, and as you come down, they get thicker and thicker and thicker. So when you're taking the stones out of the quarry, you take the thickness you want. Here's a building that was built out of that stone. So when I go and I find the thickness I want, then I rock face the stone. And, uh, but I choose the stone. I go in there and I look for certain sizes at a certain seam. And I wait till they get to that seam to use it. And this is uh, a bigger stone. So you get all different types of stones in the same quarry. You have to go small or deep. And this is uh, that building again. See certain size stones those guys used. Now we're going to go to an old abandoned quarry and we're going to take a look at that. Well, today I am in an old abandoned rock quarry and it's off the turnpike, the northeastern extension in northeastern Pennsylvania. Let's just look at it. They, was, they were working this quarries up until about 1950 when they put the turnpike in. There's the turnpike right there. And they cut right through the center of the quarry. And I, as the legend goes, they had a big lawsuit about that because the owner had abandoned it. He couldn't get his workers here. But they did a lot of the old railroad bridges and tunnels and everything out of this quarry. So we're going to take a look at it. We're looking at the top of the quarry. And that's like a conglomerate. But it's all very, very straight. So they seam it off. Same thing up there, that's a different color stone. See how flat and square it is? They, they get it off of there, they bring it down, they face it. They had a railroad track here at one time. Let's go over and look at some of these stones. Not too bad. Now when you choose these stones, you would choose them for a certain type of church. And that's what it would look like. Now let's go to Egypt and we're looking at the unfinished obelisk. They were quarrying this out of a granite quarry and it cracked so they abandoned it. And they have a display right there using a dull right pounder and they show you how you did it. But they don't show you that when you're uh, looking at these documentaries. Now this is a picture of me pointing out to this obelisk that they had on display. Here's what I want you to see. You see over here this is pretty straight. This one, uh, pretty straight. This has a big bow in it. See, when you go up a gun and see that big bow in it? And this one has a bow on the bottom. Why is that? Where's all their advanced technology? Any carver or any stonemason would see that they beat this out by hand. Anybody could see that. Where's all that uh, uh, lost technology they had? And the more you go around in Egypt, the more you kind of see that stuff. So all these people are telling you that everything they did there was perfect is nonsense. Now here's one of the points I'm trying to make. When you go to a quarry, especially in the old days, I remember I was born in the early 50s. In the 60s I was going to a quarry with my dad. He'd call them up and I'd say I need a th uh, stone that's 3 inches thick by 5 feet long by 12 inches wide. The guy would say, well I'm going to get into that seam in another three days, I'll have it for you on Friday or whatever. So you would order your stone. We would go up and they'd still be cutting the stones out. Someone would order a pair of steps. And it depends on what quarry you're going to. But if I wanted to order something for limestone for one of the limestone buildings like a church or a cathedral, they make it at the quarry. And then they ship it to you and then you fine tune it. Here's a picture of me fine-tuning one of those pieces that was going on to a mansion. And then sometimes we get it and we'd have to round face it or do whatever we do. But all this stuff is basic technology. Let me touch on this video at the Granite Museum. The guy was showing you how they uh, quarry granite and how they polish it. Strike, turn. And now taking out the stone dust with the uh, the spoons. Putting uh, the smaller version of half round and wedge and now uh, breaking that uh, block. Now the stone comes in from the quarry and it's uh, now uh, flat uh, but it is uh, very uh, unlevel. 
it is humped up. We always take the worst side first. Now uh, we put the uh, stone up on a table called a banker. Now this man can sight his stone. Now uh, build projection is now taken and we have a uh, straight border inside of build surface. The polishing process. Now we bring in from Greece. This is uh, on the scale, the Mohs index scale is uh, number 10 is diamond. The granite is number 7, quartz and hardness. This material from Greece, this is 2,000 year old quarry of emery or carborundum. This is a number 9 in hardness. So this man now uh, with this uh, stone to be polished is in the rubbing sheds. This was not called polishing sheds. It was the rubbing that this man now rubs that emery or carborundum on the stone, taking all that line texture. We hammered the granite, compacting the crystals, and now we can achieve polish. So now we use this stone, 30 grit, going one direction. We now do 60 grit, 80 grit, 100, 220, 400, 600. Now we put an oxide of tin, a white powder. We mix it with water, putting on that surface and let it harden. Now we take a felt buff. Now that felt buff is taken across the stone, heating the surface up, and now putting uh, that uh, delicious uh, luster on, uh, which is called polish. But it's a hand rubbed um, uh, surface. Well, that was from my video, Rock Facing and Shaping Stones, part 13, when I went up into Maine and I filmed it at the museum. Now, if you listen close, the guy said he used emery. This is emery. You can go to Walmart or Amazon and order it. Use it to sharpen knives, or you could polish stone with them. What else is in emery? Sandpaper. They've been using emery for years. They make carbon, carbon rundite blades from emery. You could, I'm sure the Egyptians could have put it thin like this and, and keep cutting the stones. It's not a big deal. It just takes a lot of time. This is all before, we used to use these things before the diamond blades came out. They didn't come out until about the middle 70s, and they were so expensive, nobody bought them. Everybody was still chiseling stone. Well, we're looking at some uh, riprap or granite here, and we don't want to choose anything like this that has seams in it. And we got to be careful what we're looking for. We want to get something small and flat like this, but you see this has seams in it right here. And you wouldn't pick this stone because you see that'll be chipping off. But don't look too bad. Maybe we'll just take something simple like this and see if we can hand polish that. So we're going to get a piece of the stone. Maybe this piece right here. And we're going to get our emery. We're going to dip it in the water. Start rubbing it. See what happens. We're just going to keep continuing and see how we do. See, I got some high spots in here. That's how you know how to get it down or up. We're about six minutes into it, so let's just kind of wash it off. See how we're doing. All right, that here's here's the rough spot. See the rough spot. You can see as I turn I wish it was in the Sun it's starting to shine already so tell me why everybody is saying it can't be done we're at a cemetery in Wilkes-Barre Pennsylvania and all behind me is all granite obelisk made in the 1800s now they're all saying 
they don't have the tools and the, and the technology to do it today. Well, anytime you want to look at something, you go around to the cemetery and they'll tell you if they did. So here we go. Now look at the size of this obelisk. All made out of granite. And look at the carvings they did all by hand here. See that, how beautiful that is? Now here's one of the obelisks, 1857. It's all polished. It's all straight. It looks better than anything I've seen in Egypt. So you just got to look at all this stuff. Look at all the obelisk over here. They're all out of granite and they're all straighter than anything I've seen in Egypt. Now here's one, 1829, born 1752. Look at that obelisk. Look at this, 1836. Look at all the beautiful carvings on that. Here's another one, 1868. Look at that. Now here's this stone, 1893, polished granite, and they did the vase up on top, and they did the carvings. No big deal. Now here's one. Look at this, the way they built this. This could almost be a sarcophagus. Not a big deal. So we're in this cemetery, and I showed you all the stuff they made by hand back in the late 17th to 1800s. The Giza Plateau is nothing but a cemetery. And people say to me, Mike, I want to see you make a sarcophagus. Well, how do you want to make it? When I want to make something like that, I ship it up to Vermont or Maine. I tell them what they want. And they do it by machines. Now, if you want to do it by hand, old school way, like these guys did it, then that's going to cost more money. If you want it done like the way the pyramids did it, and you got to beat it out, then that costs more money. I always people ask these people, well, how much do you want to spend? And then I never hear from them again. Now, we're in a place where they sell granite kitchen tops right here. You can see how straight they are, just looking at them. When you look into here, you see where the holes were when they split it from the quarry. So then you get over here, you got the polished stuff that they do at the quarry. You see that? Now we're going to kind of put the line up and see if they're within thousandths of an inch. So there it is. We got the line up and look at how close that is. Now are you telling me that they can't do that today? That's another myth. So if you want to go deeper into how they made the vases and everything, I would recommend going to the channel Scientist Against Myths. And that channel, they show you how to do all these things. Here's one where they're doing a vase, and it's just like a little thing. I was in a service. I was watching them doing it over in the deserts in the Middle East back in the 70s. So I highly recommend that channel. Let's just go through a few myths here. It says that the, the, they built the pyramids and then they put the outer skin in. No way. Nobody ever does that. You'll see that on cathedrals. They built a skeleton and then they put the limestone up against it. If you want to go to uh, the Cathedral of St. John's in New York City, you can actually see and vision it because it's unfinished. But not on the pyramids. They built the outside first and they just filled in with all the junk and rubble and whatever. Number two, what they did was they poured the pyramids. Do you realize that they're living in a desert? And if you want to grind its rocks down to a powder to make a concrete, you have to heat it to 3,500 degrees. They'd have to go way deep in Africa and cut all this wood and bring it back and 3,500 degrees, grind it to a powder and ca carry it over and uh, redo it. It's ridiculous. No way. Uh, it's just easier to cut the stone out and move it like they did at the Coral Castle. Another one, three, the aliens did it. Well, first of all, if you're an alien and you're as far as Alpha Centauri, it's going to take you four and a half years to get here. And then you come over here and you show them how to do it out of stone. But you don't show them the Roman arch. You don't show them anything about medicine. You don't show them anything about machinery or electricity. You show them how to build a tomb. It doesn't make any sense to me. And then go four and a half years back or at the speed of light. Uh, totally ridiculous. So in the video, I tried not to get my hands dirty to be a true bedroom archaeologist to just tell you things and show you where to go to look up things. I notice a lot of them always go to someone with higher learning, like a professor or something, to verify everything they said. So I went and found this uh, professor, uh, Douglas, with a big highfalutin education and such. 
and he's gonna he looked at my videos and he's gonna make an opinion on it uh, yeah our family has been in construction all of our lives and uh, the Mike is correct in all his synopsis okay professor when is your new book coming out well I, I really don't know yet because the civilizations aren't lost yet but I will leave a number down below for you to be able to contact me so I'm coming to the end of the video and I'm in the kitchen now I changed from being a bedroom archaeologist to a kitchen archaeologist and uh, there's a video out, it's called the Acropolis Restoration, and they use the same techniques they've been for thousands of years. Uh, those are the techniques we actually used when we were restoring those kind of buildings and building them. Then I have another video out, it's called Stone Cutting and Laying Patterns. Anything you do in stonework, you have to use patterns, and it gives a little example of thermal facing instead of rock facing. Uh, we're coming to the end of it, and just like when we did the Coral Castle and everybody made all this stuff up and then they actually had a film of them doing it, that's what I try to do is expose everything. As far as everything in Egypt, they're very, very far from perfect. If you want me, if you have a budget and you want to see a sarcophagus, we could send it up and they can make it a hundred times faster and more perfect than anything they did in Egypt, trust me. As far as what I'm impressed with in Egypt, I'm really impressed with the cathedrals in Europe. If you go to the cathedrals in Europe, that's where you'll see master carvers and everything. The Egyptian stuff is very primitive and blunt. So check out the cathedrals. It has a lot more quality to it. Don't forget that Egypt had their Michelangelo's and they had their Leonardo's and those, some of those pieces still survive and are in the Egyptian museum. And they also had jewelry makers where they, the, those jewelry makers and those tool makers would make tools out of whatever they got to make their saws and cuts out. If you're going to listen to one of these bedroom archaeologists, find out how many years they worked as a mason, how many years they worked as a stone carver, how many years they worked at moving things. If they ever did any jewelry or tool making or anything, most of the time you'll find out they never even got their hands dirty. They just point you to someone else. So that's what I try to do here. And just like the coral castle that showed everything, uh, like one of the most evil men in history said, the bigger the lie, the more the people believe it. So I try to just give you some common sense. Now some people say, well, I want to see you cut a stone out, and I want to see you move it five miles and build, build a pyramid. Well, if you want to do stuff like that, you have to have a budget. And when you go to a quarry, well, they won't let you in a quarry anymore. There's just too much liability. Uh, you have to get all kind of permits and everything, and then you have to move it. So if you want to move it the old-fashioned way, you got to hire people like cutting the forest down and making siege machines like the Egyptians did or the Romans did. And you got to be able to pay for that. And then you have to have stone carvers and tool makers. And maybe you want horses to move the stuff or maybe you want to hire a truck. And if you do want to hire someone in Pennsylvania, this is all the people you got to deal with. This is kind of for fun. Birkenheimer, the IRS, the Federal Unemployment, Workman's Compensation, State Taxes, Social Security, Pennsylvania Unemployment, Pennsylvania Department of Revenue, Right to Work Tax, Municipal Tax, Attorney General's License, Business Insurance, Obamacare, Inspection Fees, Building Permits, Third Class City Licensings, then you got to deal with OSHA, DEP, the EPA, the DOT, and the little towns to move all this stuff. So if you're going to do something like that, you have to have a budget. And it's going to be a big budget. So when you get your budget together and you want to see me do something, you let me know. Or if you can't do it in this country, fly me to another country and we'll start working on it because I'd love to be able to film that. Now as far as someone telling me what videos to go to, I don't mind if it's hands-on and it's people really doing something. But if you don't make a video yourself, and you don't have anything to show me, then I don't want to see it. You got to send me your video that you made and you're showing me something, not something else. Because I've already seen everybody's something else and that's why I made this video. So I hope you enjoyed it. A uh, different way of looking at things, food for thought. My name is Mike Haddock. I'll see you next video.